This is We the Sales Engineers Podcast, show 254. Welcome to We the SES Podcast, the show for sales engineers by sales engineers with your host, Ramsey Majaba. What's up, SE Nation? Welcome back to another episode. I am your host, Ramsey Majaba. And the world for the 2021, 2020, 2021, a lot of hiring. People were hiring like crazy. And then end of 2022 hits and people are not hiring as much and or they're letting go of people. So I know many people are looking for a job. I know many people are trying to break into sales engineering and it's a tough time. So I talk about that quite a bit. I talk about it mostly on my YouTube channel, but today I had my guest, his name, Charlie. Uh, I'm not going to try to say his last name because I've already butchered it a few times, Uh, but I'll leave a link to his LinkedIn in the show notes below. He's an experienced SE. He's an individual contributor and also a leader within his uh, like, I guess area because he helps others get to where they want to get. And I really appreciate that about him. So he, he's on the show. We're going to talk about some strategies and some tactics that you can use to find your next job, your best job, if you want to move or if you're looking for a job because you're, you were uh, found redundant, which is kind of weird to say. Anyways, let's talk to Charlie on the show and we'll get back to you after the show. Hey, Charlie, happy to have you on finally after two years of conversation. Hey, Ramsey. Likewise, man. It's great to be here. Um, so you, you, you're kind of famous in the SE world, but for those, who, uh, for those people who don't know who you are, who are you? Well, I've been an SE for a decade now, and I guess my, my claim to fame is just um, kind of helping out with people find and breaking into, you know, find SE jobs or break into sales engineering as a whole. I think it's a great path for a lot of folks, uh, people who have technical knowledge, people who are curious, people who want to help customers, you combine all those things and you get a great sales engineer. So I love just pointing out to people opportunities, uh, whether it's like a pre-sales academy or it's an apprenticeship program at Salesforce or Oracle, or it's just about different jobs and opportunities I might be aware of through my network. Um, that's kind of that's kind of what I'm, I'm in this for is to, to help people break into this career because I think you know, it's a great career. I've been doing it for a while and um, it's a good way to make a living. Why is it a great career? If you don't mind me asking. I think, I, I think if you ask hundred SEs, you probably get 99 different answers. Um, it, for me, it's the variety. It's the every day looks a little bit different. Someday you're doing a straight sales engineering role. Other days you get to pretend to be a product manager, pretend to be a CEO, pretend to be a CTO. Um, you get to, it, it's, it's a lot of fun to kind of mix up the types of customers you interact with, the verticals, even you know from day to day, how you deliver your pitch or your demo. Uh, as a sales engineer, you have a lot of control over your unique approach to to selling and demonstrating your software and all the other aspects of the job. So I enjoy that that variety and that kind of freedom to to experiment and and play around. How did you get into sales engineering to begin with? This is a uh, this is one of my favorite stories uh, because. When I graduated college, I had a degree in mechanical engineering, and I thought that's what I was going to do. Uh, you know, a lot of people probably have a, have a similar story where they get a degree in something, they think they're going to do that. Uh, but for me, what happened was I was watching Formula One one weekend, a big F1 fan. There was a car uh, that had an uh, advertisement for a company called Autonomy, and I, it stuck with me for whatever reason. And then it, I can't remember if it was like, you know, a couple of days later, a couple of weeks later, that company was uh, posting for jobs on my college job board. And I was like, oh, I wonder what they do. Turns out they were a software company. They were hiring, I think they call them technology specialists, technical specialists, but essentially sales engineers, pre-sales engineers, solutions architect, whatever term you want to use. And um, interviewed with them, got the job, moved cross country, worked with them for a number of years until they were bought by Hewlett Packard and then went to work for some startups. So like you went, you came out of university as a sales engineer. I guess, right? And now there are, I guess, universities and colleges have sales engineering programs, but I had a mechanical engineering degree. And actually, in my senior year, I took an elective like engineering economics course. And that was the first like insight I had to the idea of, like you have an engineering degree. You don't have to necessarily be a, a dive in the wool engineer. You don't have to go, you know, uh, into mechanical engineering per se. You can take your engineering degree and go into technical sales, technical writing, whatever it is. So, it was, you know, those things kind of came together. And yeah, I guess. I did leave university uh, or college as a, as a pre-sales engineer. And uh, it sounds like you only applied to one company and you got the job. Is that accurate? 
yeah, that streak uh, quickly ended after that. But yeah, I mean, I was I was fortunate <laughs> um, in that. Yeah, pretty much. Um, you know, I didn't know what the pre-sales job was, right? But this company was really focused on hiring smart people. So I work with other engineers. I work with linguists. I work with people who had just different backgrounds, which I think makes for a great SE team. Um, but I got a, I got a lot of help and coaching through the process. If I didn't have that, I probably would not have gotten the job, and I probably would have. Who knows where I would have ended up? But I was lucky in that first go around to to kind of get the gig right away. Yeah, that's funny because as soon as he said uh, hires straight uh, smart engineers, I'm like, I'm out. Um, okay, <laughs> so you applied to one company, you got the job, and we were talking. And it sounds like your view of apply application has changed since then. Uh, can you explain to to the audience and to me? Like how has that changed? What what do you do now if you were to apply for a new job? Well, it's different when you're when you're coming out of college as as opposed to someone who has kind of tenure as an SC. But I mean, I think in order to kind of apply to a listing blind and and get anywhere in the process is tough. Um, you know that spray and pray approach, unless you know you you really early in your career starting out, you're willing to take anything. It's very difficult to break into any any uh, field or career that way. I think especially for SaaS software, technical sales, um, you know, applying to a random job posting at Salesforce, unless you have some connection, some link, you have someone who can refer you, that process is very, in my experience at least, it's very difficult to get anywhere with. So now I'm more about the approach of tapping into your network, uh, your network, leveraging different communities, job boards, uh, could be from your college, could be from uh, organization you're part of, could be, you know, industry specific group could just be friends and family. Having that kind of referral, I think is is like super important. It kind of gives you that, almost kind of like gives you the ability to cut the line and kind of jump ahead in the process. You're, you're kind of coming in with a leg up or you have something that differentiates you from the hundreds or even thousands of other applicants that, that may have applied for the role. So yeah, hey, you know, if you find a job you're interested in, by all means apply for it, but dig deeper, try to make a connection there, try to find someone who can get you uh, uh, kind of ahead of the line, use your network first, tap into other resources that might be available to you. That's going to give you a much better shot than just kind of throwing darts on a map and seeing what sticks. I actually have a story about that. And I think yeah? we all have similar stories. I graduated in 2009, which was not a good time to graduate. Um, I was, yeah, 2010. So yeah. right there with you. And for the entire summer, I was applying to hundreds of jobs, whatever I could find, wherever in the world, like I could, wherever you want me to go, I'll go just give me a job. And uh, the reason I found a job is because I went to a picnic for my hometown and I met someone there who referred me, right? I applied to hundreds of jobs, didn't hear a beep. Like I heard, I got rejections for those jobs two or three years later. Yep. But I, I went to a barbecue and I got a job. So I, I agree with that assessment. Contact uh, will get you jobs. The thing that you mentioned to me that I want I really found interesting and 100% wholeheartedly, I don't know whatever other synonym we can use, agree with, uh, is that you, you see finding a job as a sales process. Yeah, I mean, you're you're selling yourself to, uh, to get the role. The company, oftentimes, right, especially working with the recruiter, they're selling you on the job or the opportunity. So I think the fact that we as sales engineers are so close to the sales process, I mean, you can literally even apply some of the techniques that that you might use in your your quote unquote day job, uh, whether it's for this negotiating a car loan. Uh, you probably don't want to apply it to you know your personal relationships that can get messy. But there's a lot of other areas that you can use these techniques and these tactics to. Uh, to give you a leg up and to give you a better chance of getting the job, getting the better uh, car loan, getting whatever it is, you know, getting your favorite restaurant on date night. Uh, there's a lot of uh, techniques you can use uh, related to what we do in sales. Yeah. So like I'm thinking about the sales cycle, you, you know, you always start with a lead, right? Lead comes in and I'm, I'm looking at some of the notes that you sent me. You have, like, mm -hmm. I want, I want people to have like the best idea of how to actually go tackle finding a job, especially in this market that we're in. Yeah. So how do you like if you were let's say god forbid you're out of a job right now how would mm -hmm. you go uh about finding a lead for a job or uh, you know let's start with the lead how would you go about finding that yeah i mean i think it's almost like sales in that like you have inbound and outbound right so inbound leads are recruiter reaches out to you or a friend reaches out to you and says hey there's this company that's hiring i think you'd be a great fit 
that's like a hot lead in sales. That's like someone who's requesting a demo on your website. You should not immediately drop what you're doing, but definitely give it some attention uh, and, and kind of act on it quickly because there's an identified need there. They know that they need to hire a, or we'll talk about this in a minute. They think they know they need to hire a solutions engineer and it seems like you'd be a great fit. So at the very least, you know, respond to the email, do the phone call. Um, you know, you, there's more qualification, like with any deal, any lead that you want to do, make sure it's in your salary range, make sure you like the manager, make sure the company is interesting to you. Um, and then kind of related to that is a referral, right? Uh, an ex uh, colleague or a friend or family member says, Hey, I, you know, there's this job I think you're really good for, I'm going to give you a referral. And that's kind of a way to skip the line. And it's also something that you should act on pretty quickly because that person is in a sense, putting their neck out for you and saying, Hey, I think I have a great candidate in mind. Um, and it gives you that ability to jump to the front of the line or certainly move up in the pack uh, more quickly than if you were just applying blind. So the opposite of that is what we talked about, kind of like uh, outbound, right? Like outbound sales, anyone who's, who's done this job long, know, long enough knows that outbound sales is so much harder than inbound sales. You have to go and find the people that need your product or have a problem that you can solve. So that's when you are you know, scouring job boards or going to Salesforce and look at the careers page and seeing what looks interesting to you. This approach is hard, but it's not impossible. I think you have to treat it almost like you would prospecting, like build your target list of industries, companies, company sizes, stages. Do you want to work for a series A startup? Do you want to work for a mature startup? Do you want to work for a big public company? Uh, and then do your research, set up Google alerts, go on TechCrunch, use Glassdoor, RepView, go on LinkedIn, see if you can kind of deduce who the hiring manager might be, send them an email or send them an email, uh, you know, anything you can do to get more knowledge to help you as you kind of make the sale, i.e., you know, pitch yourself for the job uh, is, is going to be very important. Can I offer a suggestion of how someone can change an outbound to an inbound? Yeah, please. So the way I like I talk to my my clients is it's always better. Connections get you more jobs than than resumes. So right now you have a job or you don't. Let's say you have a job. Go out and start meeting people just in case someday you might need something. And that's how you like, you're reaching out, you're outbound reaching out in preparation for sometime, someday, someone may, might reach out to you. And same if you don't have a job, just start meeting people. Go to meetups, as many meetups as possible. Go on LinkedIn and keep, keep in mind that if you meet someone and they like you, it's also in their best interest to refer you because they get also a referral fee in most cases. Yep. Right? You're not asking for something that's very selfish. I mean, you're asking for a favor because someone's putting their name on the line for you. So they, they, they have to know you, but they'll also get something out of it as well beyond just helping out a friend. So that's one way yeah. for people to go from change outbound to inbound in one way. Yeah, I like this idea of doing it when you don't need to, when you don't have to, when there's no pressure. Do it when you are... You know, you're content with your job, you're, everything's, everything's going okay, so that when you do have hard times or you, you're desperately needing something, it doesn't, you're not rushing to get it done. You already have that network built and those connections built. So I like this idea of kind of being proactive about it, building those networks, building that connection now uh, so that you don't have to stress about it, hopefully, uh, as much uh, in a pinch. Yeah. Well, one thing that I hear people say is like, why? I, I love my job. I'm happy at my job. And my response is, well, you're happy today. I was happy at my job until my manager left and I got a new one and sure. things changed drastically within half hour. So you, know, you never know that you, maybe you also be able to help somebody else. If you don't want to do it to ask for something, you can always help somebody else. Okay. So first you're getting a lead inbound or outbound yep. inbound is better than outbound. So try to convert every outbound to inbound. That's my contribution to this discussion. Yay. Uh, then, then what? Well, let's follow the sales cycle. You have the lead. Let's do some qualification. Uh, and this isn't discovery. This is this is early stage stuff. So you can make it as simple as using the BANT method, B-A-N-T, budget, authority, uh, need, and timeline. Really for like a, especially like a first round conversation with a recruiter or someone in HR, that that's fine, I think. Budget obviously is uh, salary. It is okay to ask about this. Uh, it's better to know upfront if it's not a good fit than going through the whole interview process and, and finding out. I think it's actually especially important when you don't, when you, when you are desperately looking for a job, your time is valuable. You need to stick with opportunities that are going to you know, make sense for you and your family financially. So I, even in those cases, definitely ask about the salary. Don't be nervous about it. 
Uh, we'll talk a little bit later on maybe about some methods uh, for that, but that's budget. Authority, who's the hiring manager? Who else is involved in the decision? Um, if you don't have any access to the hiring manager or the decision maker, like in sales, uh, that's kind of a red flag, right? If you keep putting that off, or if you can't, you know, even get some input and some FaceTime with that person, uh, then that is a little bit of a, a red flag. Need, uh, why do they need an SE, right? Pretty basic. Uh, it's especially important for if you're going after startups and smaller companies that don't have an SE or uh, whatever the term they want to use uh, function, right? Or is it a backfill? Or are they expanding, right? Just figure out at a basic level, you could literally ask, so why do you need an SE? Um, and sometimes people kind of balk at that. They're like, well, what if they, what if they change their mind? Like, oh, actually, we don't need an SE. Well, wouldn't you want to know Good. before you go through the whole interview process, right? Good. You figured it out. Uh, you qualified yourself yeah. out. Excellent. Exactly. Yeah. So disqualification is really what we're talking about here in some sense, right? If they yeah. won't give you a salary, they won't put you in front of the hiring manager, they don't have a clearly defined need, or worse, if they don't have a, a, a timeline, that's the T, um, you know, that's a red flag as well. Oh, we want to hire an SE eventually. You want someone who has a burning need for an SE. They want to hire someone right away. Now, even small tech companies, software companies don't move especially fast in hiring, but you know, if they can't, you know, tell you things like how many interview stages there are, when a, you know, a projected start date might be, if it's in conjunction with like, hey, we want to hire you before our big sales kickoff, right? Those are all timelines that you can look to, to help you realize, hey, this is a good lead, or this is a bad lead, and, you know, prioritize your time appropriately. So one thing I would add, like, if, if I, if you don't have too many interviews lined up, and you haven't done an interview in a long time, even if the salary is not what you want, I would say yep. go through the interview process to practice. Practice. You know, practice on the on the jobs that you don't want so that you can do well on the jobs that, that you do want. So you, you like, in, in most cases I've had, I've never had to ask for the budget or for the salary range because they always ask me up front. I'm curious, sure. how, do, yeah. how do you answer that? What is your expected salary range or what do you make today? Uh, it's tough. And this is like one of those things like, you know, good sales negotiators have this down pack. There are plenty of books on negotiation. Uh, Chris Frost, Never Split the Difference is, is one that uh, is pretty well regarded in sales cycle. Yeah. Uh, oftentimes, it's just a matter of who flinches first. So take a breath, pause and turn the question around. Just, well, I'm not comfortable sharing that information yet, but what range do you have budgeted for this position? Or what do you, you know, what, what is a typical SE with five years experience in making your company? You can add some humor and say, if they, if they press you like, well, I need to know your salary. Say, hey, even my mom doesn't know how much I make, right? Like you can push yeah. off, delay, defer as much as possible. And eventually the other person will, will kind of crack and show their hand first. Usually nine times out of 10, that'll, if you just put up a little resistance, they'll say, oh, well, we have X to Y budgeted. And you can say, oh, that sounds good. Or no, that's terrible. What seems to work for me is when I say, like, listen, it's too early for me to actually tell you because I don't yeah. know what the job entails. I need to talk to a lot more people to figure out that number. But in general, what's the salary range that you usually offer? And yep. for some reason, every time they tell me. And I think one time they didn't tell me. And I had to push. And it was like, it was so low. Like, yeah. It was almost insulting. And that's why they didn't want to tell me. Like, if the pay is so competitive, why don't you tell me what it is, right? Exactly. Like, they want to entice you. They want to sell you. They get paid if you get hired, right? I think. Uh, at least third-party recruiters. I don't know about yeah. uh, people, like, internal. Yeah. first-party recruiters. Is that is that the right term? So, yeah. like it's That's – yeah. always ask for if, – if they're proud of what they make. I like that. If, if they're proud of how much they offer, they will tell you. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. Especially if they want you. <laughs> um, right. Okay. So you said budget authority. Here's the thing about authority that I've found. No one has the authority, it seems. Although there's a hiring manager. It's, right. It's, it's a decision by consensus of 17,000 people. Yeah. Committee. Um, so how, how, do you, how do you mitigate that? If, if you can. Yeah. Sometimes you just can't. Well, that's an important distinction. So there's also the MedPIC system for, for qualification um, or MedEc. Some, some companies use a variant on that. So there's this idea in the sales cycle of the economic buyer. That's the person who actually controls the budget and the purse strings. And depending on who you're talking to, that might be the hiring manager's boss. It might be their boss. It could go all the way up the chain. So it is important to, to some sense, figure out, okay, who is ultimately kind of signing off on my hire? Typically for uh, a sales engineer, it's going to be head of sales, VP of sales, chief revenue officer. 
Uh, it could be de uh, depending on the size of the company, um, yeah, head of sales engineering, VP of sales engineering, CTO, but there's usually going to be someone, it may not always be the hiring manager. In fact, a lot of the times there's going to be someone above the hiring manager who has the budget, who has the purse strings. We call that the economic buyer. That's the E in med pick. Try to figure that out. You definitely, especially in a smaller company, you know, a, a earlier stage startup, you're going to be working with that person a lot. So you want to meet with them anyways. Um, but try to figure out who that is so that, you know, uh, obviously you want to impress the hiring manager and they're going to be the one who ultimately says, yep, I want to hire this person. But if they can't make a case for you, and especially if you have higher salary demands or whatever, uh, we'll talk about coaches and champions. And if they can't champion uh, for you, um, then, you know, there's going to be someone above them who can kind of, you know, give the rubber stamp or, or not. So yeah, the economic buyer and finding out who that is in any sales cycle, uh, you yeah. know, the economic buyer in your household might be you, it might be your wife, it might be, you know, the dog, uh, it's not always the one who, who kind of gives the final okay, necessarily. The biggest stakeholders I find for hiring an SE is the SE manager and the salespeople that they're going to yeah. be working with. Yep. And on occasion, some teammates, some SE teammates. So if you can yeah. get those to like you, if you get one of them to not like you, you're screwed, basically. Because if, <laughs> if a salesperson doesn't like you and they say no, the sales engineer manager could still hire you, but it's going to be a tough life for you. <laughs> so, right. so build a good relationship from the start. Okay. Uh, I mean, you mentioned like figuring out the interview process. Yeah. I mean, most companies I've seen have a very rigorous interview process. What have you seen in terms of what the interview process has been for the companies? Uh, yeah. It's talk to? Man, it's very common to have a multi-stage, you know, sometimes it takes half a day or even a whole day for like that. And that could just be like the final round, right? So yeah. op oftentimes there's a recruiter screen, right? So the recruiter will reach out to you, whether it's an internal or external recruiter and say, hey, I have this opportunity. You think you'd be a good fit. You say, yeah, that sounds good. I'll jump on the phone. And, you know, they're going to ask you some pretty basic questions. You know, it, it's usually not very tough. They just kind of want to get a sense for you and your experience. You almost can't screw it up, right? Don't overthink it. Just show up, be happy, be cheery. Um, ask the question that you want to get answered. Uh, and usually they will uh, then pass you on to the hiring manager who do kind of their own screen. And this is more to kind of gauge your technical level, what skill set you have, your experience, assess how you'd fit on the team. Then there might be a tech screen where you meet with the SE colleagues and they might have a technical challenge or problem for you. It could be a coding exercise. I've done those before. It could just be more of like a chat like, you know, tell me how an API works or, or specific questions relevant to your industry or your role. Yeah. Then there's probably going to be a sales round where you talk to the account executives and they just want to know how much of a pain you're going to be when they, you know, send you a last minute demo request on, on Friday afternoon, which is you're going to be a good pain because you're a good SE and you need discovery notes before you jump on a demo. But, you know, that's an important step of the process because you're going to be working with those people, literally sometimes those people or their colleagues. So yeah. you definitely want to make sure that um, you know, there's a good fit there. And this is all two way, right? You're at the same time assessing, Hey, can I work with these people? Do I like the hiring manager? Does the company culture seem good? And then usually there's some kind of like final demonstration or presentation, you know, it could be demo, our product it could be demo, your product it could be demo, any product you want. It could be a whiteboarding exercise. It could be a PowerPoint presentation. It could be, you know, any number of kind of things, but that's like the culmination. That's like, can you take each little thing we just had you go do? can you put them together and give, you know, a sales pitch, right? That it's kind of the final sales pitch for, for you as a, as a candidate. It's a sales pitch for, Hey, how you fit in the organization. It's a sales pitch for what you've learned about the company, their technology, their industry. So that final presentation is often kind of the make or break, you know, the first couple stages, I want to call them easy, uh, but usually not too strenuous or too stressful. But once each of those individuals or, or those teams gives their, gives their okay, then you give the final presentation. Hopefully, Hopefully that's it. It can go on past that, but it's very common to have at least, what is that? Five different stages. And the fifth stage is really, again, it could be half a day. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've had interviews where it goes beyond that. And that's just like, Hey, let's meet the VP of sales engineering. It, right. It's just more of a formality than like, uh, that's exactly. like it's, it's yours to lose. They chose you. If they're, if you're going to meet that. My biggest pet peeve with these interviews. And I don't know if any SE manager is listening, please. Maybe you know, I'm going to offer a solution because I never come up with, I hate to say, oh, I hate this and not offer a solution is that it takes so long, mainly because you talk to the recruiter, 
And then they hang up. Then they go talk to the hiring manager. They figure out what time they can talk to you. Hey, offer some time. You select that time. You you interview with the hiring manager. They like you. They do the same thing with one, two, or three SEs. And then they do just schedule all the interviews. They don't have to be in the same day. Schedule all the interviews two, one day or two days apart. And then if at some point someone says no, cancel the rest of the interviews. So it doesn't take three months or four months, which I've like I've had interviews uh, processes like that took four months. My current job, I was hired within three months. I was interviewing at the same time with another company that I've been interviewing with that for a month before I started this company. And by the, by the time I got the offer, I started the job and I'm still interviewing for that company. And at that point, I'm like, you know what? I've been on the job. Like, it's not like I can just leave now. I've taken the job. So yeah, it's a pet peeve of mine. Sorry for the rant. Um, well, someone at Trulia was paying attention because we adopted that kind of like block interview style to help compress the time frames. Because yeah, you can you can have a week between each of those meetings. Then you're looking at what a month and a half before you can kind of have a decision. That would be relatively yeah. short. You know, it's it's very common to have two or three months go by between the initial contact with the recruiter and when a decision is made. Well, so many things can happen. Sales kickoffs can happen. Vacations. Someone's sick. So many things can happen to just prolong it. And if you're as much of a hurry as you say you are, which they're almost always are in a hurry to hire someone. Why are you taking so long? Why why are you giving the chance for another company that's faster to come and steal the steal the interviewee? Um, I like what you said that it's a two way street. Yeah. So as an individual interviewing for the role, what are you trying to find out, and how do you make it a two way street? Because I hear a lot of SEs, a lot of people sit in an interview get asked all the questions in the last five minutes, the, the interviewer turns around and says, do you have any questions for me? And at that point, it's just too late to ask any questions. Right. Are you... You're lucky to get five. Usually it's the last 30 seconds. Oh, I know we're running over time, but anything, any questions that I can ask for, answer for you? And you're like, uh, how do you like the company? It's great. Yeah. Okay. Bye. Yeah. So like, what do you try to discover? How do you make sure you have time to actually discover it? Yeah, I think uh, kind of going back to this idea of qualification using MedPick, uh, one of the Ds in MedPick is decision criteria. And that's twofold. They have decision criteria that they're applying to the SD candidates around technical skills and your soft skills. Uh, but you also have your decision criteria when it comes to, hey, am I going to take a new job? So everything from the management style, is there an opportunity for leadership or promotion? Um, you know, do they have... Uh, even like if you're, you know, especially when you're interviewing with a startup, like, do they have product market fit? What's their total addressable market? Like, are, is it, do they have a viable path towards profitability? You know, all those sort of things that may matter to you, depending on where you are in your, uh, in your career and, in, in you know, what you want to achieve in your next role. There's also this idea in sales of like give to get, right? Like I, I will sit here and answer your questions about, you know, things I did, you know, 10 years ago in my first job. But I want to do, you know, I want to have some additional questions answered. You can request additional meetings. Hey, at a startup, you can say, I want to talk to the CEO or the CPO, the chief product officer, the, whoever. Uh, I want to know, like, their vision for the company. Because that's so important when you're joining a 25-person company, even a 250-person company, as opposed to a Google or a Salesforce or whatever, right? Um, ask for feedback. Uh, ask for additional preparation sessions. You wouldn't go into a, a customer meeting where you were expected to present for an hour long without getting some feedback from the customer. Even if it's 15 minutes and the customer says, here's what we're expecting to show, you know, us to show. Here's who's going to be in the meeting. Here's, here's the questions they might ask. Do the same thing for your interview process. It's a kind of a red flag if they aren't willing to meet you halfway and say, oh, yeah, well, I, you know, we've scheduled the, the final onsite, but you will give you half an hour with the hiring manager before to answer any questions. Maybe review your deck, review your presentation. Those are all things that you're well within your your rights and really should be asking for to give yourself a good shot at uh, getting the getting the role and also making sure that it's going to be a company that you want to work for. It's an interesting product, technology, problem space uh, for you personally. So it should be a two-way street. You should have, you know, don't go in with questions about like, yeah, how do you like working at the company? Uh, go in with questions about you know, when you get a one-on-one -on -one with the SD colleagues, how do you like so-and-so's management style? Is there anything that irks you about them? People want to, you know, people love to, to talk about themselves and their jobs. So give them something uh, meaty to chew on and uh, they'll, they'll be happy to share, you know, as much information they can about the company culture or what challenges they're seeing on the sales team or whatever. 
uh, that might influence your decision one way or the other. Yeah. And one thing I like to do as well, in addition to pretty much what you said, uh, what, what you said, I feel like it's a good way for me to discover if I want to work for them. Um, but I also like to discover what's the pain that they're going through. I think you, you mentioned that. Right? Yeah. Like, what is the problem they're trying to solve? I want to discover that because sometimes, and every every person in the interview process has a different problem. And a hiring manager has a different problem than a colleague that's going to have to back you up in case you, you suck, right? Um, so that that's the problem that you're trying to solve. You're trying to convince them that you're not going to suck. Like one, one of the interviews I've had, they really wanted someone technical in their industry. And it's from a different industry than I'm in. And I couldn't solve that problem for them. And I could tell yeah. like, this is not going to work out. Right. Um, so figure out what the problem is that they want to solve and highlight it. it treat it as a discovery call. Right? Like, yeah. What is it that you want? And think about, do you even want to solve that problem? If their problem is, hey, we need another, another SE to do RFPs all day. For me personally, that'd be a hard no. no. I would run away from that. I think 90% but, of the, the problem is they won't tell you that. Right. <laughs> Until you're in the That's job. day one, they tell you, oh, hey, yeah. here's a stack of RFPs to do. But you never know who might let it slip if you ask the right questions and you can ask the same questions to every single person and they will give you yeah. different answers. Um, the one thing, so I've done an interview process and you mentioned that you can ask for additional yeah. sessions where the hiring manager actually offered to do a, a dry run with me for my demo. Yeah. Yeah. And during the demo, like during the dry run, he gave me all the feedback. And when I went to the demo, it was great just because he offered that. And if you ask a hiring manager, can you do this for me? Can we do a role play? Or can someone on your team do a role play with me? And they say no. I mean, they're not supporting you to get the job. What are they going to do once you get the job? And so, yeah, I, I love that. And you just put it in like, like for me, it's like, oh, it happened. But you just made it clear for me. Yeah, there's this idea of like a coach or a champion, right? So at the minimum, you want the hiring manager to, to be a good coach. You want them to give you feedback throughout the process, do a demo die run. Uh, but ideally, they're also a champion, which is to say they will, if you know, if it comes down to one or, one or two or three candidates and you're one of them, they, they're going to stick out you know, their neck for you and make the case for you. How do you develop that? It's tough, man. It, it's really tough even in sales. Um, but I think part of the way you do it is by asking intelligent questions, by putting in the work, by showing up uh, and just building a rapport with that hiring manager and kind of convincing them that, you know, maybe, you know, maybe you don't have the exact right technical background, but you're really strong in this other area, or you'd be a great, you know, uh, fit on the team, or maybe you could mentor some uh, yeah. earlier stage folks, right? So build, a, certainly build at least a coach, someone, whether it's the initial recruiter, or it could be, the, it could be either of them or the hiring manager, really, you know, build the champion as much as possible out of your hiring manager um, so that when it comes down to you versus another candidate, maybe you're X number of dollars more expensive a year. They're going to say, yeah, but he's worth it. He or she is worth it. So that coach versus champion and building that throughout the, uh, the interview process, much like you would in the sales process is really important. That goes back to discover what the problem, what their problem is. Their yeah. Personal problem, yeah. Right? If, if they have too many people and they can't coach, they don't have time to coach everybody. That's what you can offer them. Like, yeah, I've actually, and that's something you can highlight in the interview. Like, I love coaching people. I love mentoring. I have a side gig to actually help people, right? It's, uh, that could be one problem. Another, it could be not the problem. And if you offer that solution, you're not solving anything. So try to find out what it is and highlight it. One thing uh, you mentioned, like, if you don't have the technical background, I always teach focus on your impact. Right. What have you done for the company? That's beyond technology. I, like I configured a router is not really an impact. Anybody can configure a router. AI can do that right now. What has your impact been? Have you configured it faster than anybody else? Have you figured out a new way of doing it? That's that's what you can focus on if you don't have the technical know-how to yeah. overcome that, right? Because it's still a challenge. They they always prefer people with the technical know-how over people without if all if everything else is equal. So. I I like that. Okay. Um, so you went you went through that. You did the demo. You did the presentation. They made you do like another interview with the VP of Sales Engineering. Another one with the VP of Sales. You're gonna get the offer. How how like how do you negotiate the salary? Can you negotiate the salary? 
Uh, you can, and you really should. Um, again, kind of going back to what we talked about, you don't, there, there's no rule that says you have to reveal either what you make today or what you want to make. Um, there's a great uh, scene from the TV series Mad Men where uh, the ad agency that the focus of the show is potentially being bought by a bigger ad agency, and they're talking about you know what the price would be. And Bert Cooper says, let them open the kimono first. In other words, let the other person go first. Let them throw their price out there. Maybe it's double what you were expecting, right? Uh, the moment you say, well, I make X, y, X now, and I could, I could, you know, if I got Y, I'd be happy. You don't know that they were, you know, ready to offer you Z, which was, you know, two times uh, what you make today, right? So okay. as much as possible, uh, and this is easier to do, right, when you're when you're comfortable in your job, which is why it's important to do interview practice when you're comfortable with your job. Hey, if you really like your job, take that call. There's no pressure if it goes poorly. If it's something you really like and you do well, great, you have an option. Build that network so that, you know, you're not stressing over these things. Um, and it's funny, we talked about this earlier, like, you know, recruiters get compensated, uh, much like us in sales, right? When the deal closes, right? Or it's kind of like, uh, you know, we always think real estate agents want you to get the best price for your house. That's not really true. They want your house to sell because until it sells, they don't get a nickel. So that, you know, let's use hypothetical numbers. Uh, that 10K extra year salary for you is really important. But in their pocket, that's only an extra, an extra 1K. They'd much rather have you take the lower salary, close the deal and move on to the next opportunity. You know, it seems kind of cynical. We, we in sales do the same thing, right? So, you know, don't, don't count on the fact that the recruiter is going to push for you to make the highest salary. The recruiter wants you to get hired. Uh, you know, at, at the end of the day. So, you know, there's a lot of material on this. Uh, you can go in with a negotiation sheet, the things that say, I'm willing to give up X in exchange for Y. You can get creative with perks like, you know, PTO or stock options if you're if you're talking to startups. There are a couple of different levers you can pull. Um, but the most important thing is, you know, as hard as it is, uh, don't, you know, don't open your mouth until you have to. Let them say, oh, well, our, our usual range for this is X. How does that sound? You can say, sounds great. That's all you have to say. You don't have to say, oh, it's twice what I'm making now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, just, yeah. Just say, sounds great and, and move on. I love the fact, like you said, like have the, have a negotiation sheet of what are you going to give up? That means that you know what you want to begin with. Like, yeah. If you're going into a negotiation, know what you want, your walkaway number and, and all that. Um, and at some point you get to the point where they're not offering you double the amount that you're making today. Like if you're making, if you've been in SE for a while, you're pretty much making top range and you're just looking for incremental increases at that point. At which at that point, I don't mind sharing my yeah. current salary just to make a point that what you're offering me is not enough. Like it's not like, even if you're offering me 10, 20, 30 K over, it's not enough for me to risk moving to a different company, risk having to learn a new product, risk getting laid off within the first month because I don't know the culture, risk having a bad manager. So yeah, there are certain situations where you can do certain things, but I agree with you wholeheartedly. Again, I haven't disagreed with you with anything today, which is, I, I need to, I need, I'll find something to disagree with by the end of the call. Basically, let, let them start first. Let them put in yeah. the first offer and then you can negotiate. You can always anchor high. I've actually done that yeah. where like, oh, you know, like, uh, how, how much are you expecting to make? Oh, did you hear that AWS offers their employees like 400K and, uh, to begin with? And it's like, all right, well, we're not offering 400K. Oh, how, how much are you offering? It's like, oh, we're, that, that, that seems to work out. And I think also recruiters have studied negotiation processes. Yeah. Well. So it's not like you're going to fool them or anything. No, you know, we're talking about uh, salary a lot today, but there are plenty of other reasons to take a job. Like you mentioned, maybe you have a new manager you don't like. Maybe maybe you want to move into management and, and that path is blocked from your current company. Maybe you don't think your current company is, is long for this world, right? So salary is an important part of it, but it's not the end all be all. Maybe you really, maybe you really believe in a, a startup and you want uh, as much stock options as possible and you're in a financial position, lucky you, where the cash isn't as important, right? So Salary is important, but there are other things that that make up the job offer, the work-life balance, the benefits, the perks, the team, uh, the product, right? So, you know, don't focus solely on the salary. If, if uh, you know, if it's important to you, great. Work on getting as high as possible. But there are other reasons to, to change careers or change companies. Again, we're going back to know what you want, right? Know what you want. The yeah. one thing I would add is don't give up anything without getting things in return. Yeah. 
could be a title, say, well, hey, you know, I'm a senior now. I really want to be principal. Most companies, they don't yeah. care. It, yeah. Sure, you're or principal sales engineer, especially an, startups. An extra day off. Like, like yeah. what, what is it that you want? Like, what's your wish list? What are you willing to give up? And if you give up this, what are you going to ask for in return? Like extra RSU, extra week off, uh, more benefits, more help. I don't know if that's possible because most companies have contracts. But what is it that you want to ask for that? And it, make sure it's formal because I've I've had it in the past where like my manager and I would have an agreement and then he'd leave. And then... My yeah, I'm supposed guy, to get every Friday off. Didn't, didn't Joe tell you I get every Friday off? Right? Well, I, it literally, it actually happened where I... My manager and I discussed like I'm gonna have a week off, an extra week off every year because I'm coming from one company that offers 22 days to a company that offers 15, including sick days. Right, one 20 days unlimited, 22 days unlimited sick days, one 15 days with sick days. So I told him I'm not calling, I'm not taking any sick days as vacation days, and I'm taking an extra week off. He's like, sure, he left. Now what? <laughs> right. Uh, luckily, he the other manager was too remote to figure out what I was doing, so it didn't really matter. But still, uh, <laughs> always keep the emails. I guess is the moral of the story. Yeah. Um, is there anything you wanted to talk about that I didn't mention, or is there anything you wanted to discuss a little bit more? Yeah, I think there's just a couple little miscellaneous things that I've uncovered over the years, and we already touched on one, which is just interview a couple times a year, even if you're happy, once a quarter. Recruit a message, you know, especially. If you get a passive message or if you're passively job searching, you get a message from a recruiter, it sounds interesting to you, you know, the salary checks out, take a call. It, the worst thing that happens is it's good practice and, you know, it's a skill like any other. If you, if you, I mean, most of us only interview one every couple of years, right? Yeah. Uh, so if you can do it once a quarter, you're going to be ahead of the game. And you mentioned like this idea of like, yeah, if you, if you flub it, no problem. And now the next one that you have lined up, you're going to, you're going to crush because you kind of have already got that you've gotten your bad luck out of the way so you know it people often think about like jobs is you know changing jobs is stressful and people rank it up there with moving house or getting married or having a kid um and oftentimes like you know the best find the best time to find a new job and i realize in today's uh uh climate this is you know maybe not the case for everyone but you know the best time to find a job is when you already have a job it's a lot easier uh, yeah. unfortunately in some ways to, to do that so Keep your interview, interview skills sharp. It's also how you build a network because maybe the job's not right fit for you, but you know the perfect candidate and the hiring manager remembers that. And when another opening comes up, they, they come back and, and contact you. The other thing I like to do is just keep a brag sheet. This is something that I learned a couple of years ago. Um, it's, you know, it's hard to remember even at the end of the quarter what you worked on. So as you're going along, you know, at least once a quarter, maybe once a month, you know, not just for the deals that you close, but any other projects you worked on, the impact you had, um, you know, any certifications, courses you took. It's going to make it a lot easier when someone says, what did you do five years ago at company XYZ? And you're like, oh yeah, let me just look at my list. And here's all the things I did. Here's all the deals I closed. Here's all the projects I worked on. If you have a brag sheet, keep it in Google Docs, keep it in Dropbox paper, you know, probably under your personal email address is better. Uh, but make it portable, up, keep it up to date once a month, once a quarter, whatever your memory will uh, allow for, so that you're not stumbling for an answer when someone says, tell me about the most interesting deal you ever worked on, right? Like, you, you know what it is, because you have two or three already listed out on your brag sheet. Yeah. Um, unrelated, well, related, but unrelated. Do you have any horror stories of interview experiences? Like, did you mess uh, up an interview so much that you still remember it to this day? You know, not really, actually. I've, I haven't done, I've only had a couple of jobs since I got out of college. I haven't done a whole lot of interviewing, even though I just told everyone go and interview as much as possible. Um, I think, you know, part of that is, is just qualification right up front. Like I'm only, if I'm going to sit down and devote the hours and hours of time that, that, you know, it takes to do a good job for a job interview, it darn well it better be something sure that I'm interested in that offers a competitive salary or whatever it is I'm looking for in the role, whether it's management potential more time off, whatever it is, you know, so I do, I do a lot of calling out. I would say, you know, not to brag, but you know, if I get 10 LinkedIn messages from recruiter, I ignore nine of them or I say, no, thanks, not interested. So it's very rare that I, you know, go far along in the process that, you know, that I'll bomb an interview because I've already done before I get to that stage, I've done a lot of research and preparation because it's something that I'm truly interested in, you know, most of the time. Yeah, well, I have one, which I will share with you afterwards. If people <laughs> want to listen to it, they should come and talk with me. We'll talk, uh, then that was in my early days. It is time to move on to the not so fire on uh, Charlie. 
these are the same four questions I asked pretty much every guest. They change over time a little bit, but they've been stable for a while. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Sure. Yeah, so you're, you're, you're trying to help people figure out how to interview for sales engineering jobs. Uh, yeah. What do you love about the sales engineering world? You know, I think for me, it's it comes down to a lot of just the variety, the flexibility, the autonomy uh, that, that comes with the role. Every day you're talking to a new customer. They have a different set of problems. It could be across industries. Uh, I've gotten to work across different cultures, you know, North America versus Latin America. Uh, the ability to to learn additional languages and different different cultural differences is really cool. Um, I think, you know, and it also comes down to just, you know, I've always been kind of a problem solver. When I got out of college, I had an engineering degree, didn't know what to do with it, but this is a good way to apply those technical skills with my, you know, desire and and want to to help people and, and solve problems. So yeah, I think that's what keeps me interested in this this gig. We were joking earlier about RFPs. There's certainly parts of the job that that aren't fun. Although yeah there's a lot of a uh, lot of progress in automating responses to those and, and those yeah. might those might go away in terms of like our you know input in them to a large extent uh, which is which is both cool and scary and to some extent yeah that's wishful thinking I, I don't know if it's scary uh, unless the RFP thing the automated thing messes up the answers and then we have to or it takes over everything right like you know that, that's the thing I don't, like kind of what we were talking about earlier about the impact I don't know if you can replace yeah. the impact of an SE with uh well i hope not at least maybe I'm not, not yet <laughs> all right uh so second question of the not so fire on like i don't know i think like all engineers we like superheroes uh at least some i do what do you think is your superpower I would say this kind of goes back to the previous answer. I think it's adaptability i think it's just like being able to adapt to a situation right like SEs for better or worse. Uh, I remember in my 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 first SE job, um, I made the mistake of letting people know that I, letting people know that I knew Linux. And then one Friday afternoon, server went down somewhere, and that's how I spent my Friday night. Was like doing server, you know, backup work uh, in a you know in a in a back room somewhere in in uh, Silicon Valley, right? So. You know, but that's part of it is just like being able to, and then the next day you're talking to, you know, you're, you're giving a presentation alongside the CEO to your biggest marquee customer. And then the next day you're sitting down and helping a customer uh, debug code, right? So just being able to fluidly shift, not just like, you know, um, uh, between kind of different job roles or responsibilities, but even within the single conversation, right? You go into a customer and you have, uh, a four hour long block. The first hour is the marketing people. The second hour is the technology people. The third hour is a demonstration. And you're expected to, if not lead, certainly contribute to all those different uh, conversations. So being able to think on your feet, uh, not getting flustered when, you know, demos don't work and you don't have the cable to hook your, well, this doesn't happen anymore, but you know, the cable to hook up to the projector in the conference room, right? Like not, you know, being prepared, having a backup plan and yeah. being able to adapt quickly, I think is what makes, you know, for, if I had to hire on one SE attribute, that'd probably be it. That's good. I like that. Um, all right. So the third question is: Is there a habit, uh, is there a resource you would recommend for SEs to get better at sales engineering? You know, I'm going to give a slightly different or kind of off the wall answer to, into some regards. I would say, you know, if you if you go into we the sales engineers or pre-sales collective, there's book clubs, there are resources. Everyone's reading those articles. Go ahead and read those. They're, they're perfectly good. I try to get inspiration from uh, different places, pop culture things, just different like interests and hobbies of mine. Like I, you know, I was talking about Mad Men earlier. Most, most people don't apply Mad Men to sales engineering or sales, right? Um, but if you watch the show, there's a lot of kind of sales and, and marketing kind of things that get discussed in that. Uh, read fiction books. Um, <laughs> just, I don't know. I, I don't think, I think what part of what makes SE so interesting is they are kind of a motley crew. There's just a, there's a lot of variation in hobbies and interests. So lean into those and apply what you can uh, from those to, to your day job. If you like, you know, uh, you might think, well, how is taking apart vintage audio equipment and putting it back together relevant uh, to my job? It isn't necessarily, but that logical thinking, that troubleshooting, that debugging certainly is. And hell, who knows, one day you're going to build instant rapport with a customer because they have the same kind of weird niche hobby, right? So I would say don't focus on, 
you know, reading all the books and attending all the seminars, certainly do that, you know, read, never split the difference and read spin selling. Um, but don't make it, you know, don't make it the whole aspect of your, your SE career and your personality, find other, you know, things that inspire you that, you know, that make you creative and apply those to your job. Well, a lot to take in. I, that's why I call it not so, the not so fire round because I get to interject. Um, I love the fact that you said about like, take things apart and, and learn it. It may come in handy. The one thing I like to do as well is from the other side. Why did some business person decide to let an engineer do this? Right? Or how did an engineer convince the person, the business person, that this was a good idea? What was the business problem that it was trying to solve? Right? And that I found that helped me more than almost anything else because now I'm thinking from both sides. Like I'm, I'm the engineer who likes to do stuff. How do I convince somebody else to let me do it? Right? Uh, so I, I like, I like that. Yeah, man, a lot of, uh, I did uh, debate uh, in high school. I did theater in high school. Like a lot of those skills are really applicable to what we, what we do. So you'll hear, uh, you know, salespeople talk about doing improv classes because it helps them just, you know, think on their feet. It helps them kind of be creative. Um, so I think there's a lot of different areas in our lives that we can use to, to hone our SE skills or our sales skills that might not, you know, literally just be read this sales book, attend this sales conference, whatever. Those are all important, but you know, there, there are a number of areas that you can, you can learn different skills from. I mean, you said it earlier, like sales engineering can be applicable to so many different areas of real life. Like sales engineering yeah. I find is real life. Sales engineering is problem solving just at a like intense level. Right. Um, yeah. Okay. I love that. So much to talk about, Charlie. All right, last question of the not so fire out. Is there a habit you're working on today to improve in your personal or professional life? Is there a habit I'm working on? Uh, I always need to improve my organizational skills. I just, we were joking earlier, my office is a mess. That's partly because I'm doing home renovations, but even if it wasn't, it would still be a mess. Um, and I'm, I, I realize I'm never gonna be that, you know, Marie Kondo, super organized, you know, minimalist person. But I, you know, I bought like a file folder organizer. I'm trying to get all my tax documents ready. It's tax season here in the States. So, you know, little things like that, uh, that, you know, if you have kind of like a, a clean ordered office, it's a lot easier to have a clean ordered work day and, and, you know, focus on the things that matter. So that's, that's one habit I'm definitely uh, always working and improving on, not making much progress, uh, but, you know, just having, having those little incremental grains is, is nice. Yeah. I've been working on sleeping early for like three years now. Um, nice. How's it work? How's uh, that going? No, still sleeping around the same time. I moved up, I think, from uh, 1030 to 10. Right? So in the next three years, I might move it up to 930. <laughs> Hopefully, if the kids let me. All right. Yeah, right. Um, so th th this is the end of the show, Charlie. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Where can people reach out and connect with you if they so choose? And where can the recruiters not reach out and connect with you? Same place, LinkedIn. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm in the PSC, the pre prospective Slack. Um, you might find me on there. Uh, you might just see me on a sales demo someday. Maybe in, you'll be on the opposite side. That'll be good. Awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Charlie. And uh, if, if there's anything else you wanted to add, uh, I'll, I'll leave it open to you. Otherwise, we can say goodbye. No. Cheers. Thanks, Ramsey. I really appreciate it, man. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie, for coming on, and thank you for listening. This show wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you. And I know a lot, some of us are actually struggling, or some are actually struggling, and they're looking for their next adventure. So hopefully this helps. Um, if you know someone who needs help, share this video with them. Let them check out the SE hotline, because I'm happy to help. And that's it. That's it for today. I, I really hope you liked it. Leave a rating and review if you did enjoy it. If not, then... Well, what didn't you enjoy? How can I get better? Let me know. With that, I'm signing off.